This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I will be welcoming Jeff Hayes. He has been the uh, webmaster for uh, sleepawaycampmovies.com since the late 90s. And he has a book out, Sleepaway Camp, Making the Movie and Reigniting the Fire. You know, it's about, you know, the movie, the Sleepaway Camp movies and the journey, I guess, he's been on, you know, uh, with the the movie series, you know, with the website and everything. And it's going to be a great conversation today. I love Sleepaway Camp. You know, I've only had one guest from it on here. And due to politics and bullshit, I haven't been able to get anybody else on it from, but it's okay. Um, you know, I read the sample uh, of the book on Amazon. And from what I've read so far, it looks pretty entertaining. I'm going to get the whole book. You, you can go to, um, you know, Amazon or the website sleepawaymovies.com and uh, get a copy of the book, and it's going to be a great conversation. Um, I can't wait. And also, too, this is the last show for January. You know, uh, January's been a crazy, interesting month. I am looking forward to February. We're going to celebrate Women in Horror Month, you know, and I'm so excited, you know, and... You know, this movie, Sleepaway Camp, would qualify as a Women in Horror Month um, thing, but I'm putting this out on the 31st as a little teaser of what to come. So yeah, here is my interview with Jeff Hayes. Hey Jeff, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? I am fantastic. This is such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Happy to do it. Absolutely awesome. So, let's start with the book, Sleepaway Camp, Making the Movie and Reigniting the Fire. Um, I haven't read the whole book yet. I've only read the Amazon sample, um, but I will read the rest of it. Uh, I'm shocked that a book hadn't been written, you know, about Sleepaway Camp before. And you've obviously have had the website for many years, and you've moderated the DVDs and so forth. But like, what was the genesis of writing a book, you know, at this this late in the game? Yeah. Um, so, uh, 1984 Publishing got in contact with me, and they were like. They had followed my story because yeah. we started the website back in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. They had actually been following the website since way back then. And um, they were like, you know, we're thinking about maybe putting out a sleepaway camp book if you would be interested in writing it. Yeah. I said, okay, well, you know, what, what would that entail? Like, what would it be about? And so we kind of went back and forth with different ideas. And, uh, and we figured it out. And, it, and that's why it, you know, it's happening now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how long did it take for the book to be written? Um, I, I mean, I would say I spent probably like a year, like, you know, just over time working at it a little by little and, yeah. and, and until I, you know, got everything all together, like, you know, the various interviews and the pictures and just the, everything that I'd done over the years to kind of just accumulate it and put it all together for the book. Yeah, and of course you had to get it out for the 40th anniversary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is so awesome. Yeah, um, like one thing I read in the intro that I had no idea was that Rob Hiltzig was influenced by The Omen for Sleepaway Camp. I would have never have thought that, you know, I mean, I knew it wasn't a Friday the 13th ripoff because they're two very different types of summer camp slasher movies. But, wow, The, the Omen, I would have never have thought... Yeah, no, when I, when I first asked him, like, what were some horror movies that inspired Sleepaway Camp? You know, I was expecting him to be, like, you know, and things like that, but that's yeah. not what he said. He was like, you know, no, nah, it was more movies like The Omen. And I guess, you know, it's the idea of evil, maybe, that, that he got from that. But, but yeah, it was that and um, actually some science fiction stuff that inspired him as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, uh, so, like, was it in your head, though, for years that you were going to write a book and you were just resisting it? No, actually, it's crazy, but I just, like, you know, if there was something I wanted to put out, I could always just put it on the website. Putting yeah. everything for it. It had been over 20 years. 
1984, it was like, hey, you know, let's take all this and, and you know, you can make a book out of it and, you know, really kind of tell your story. Mm-hmm. Your journey started way back with the website in the late 90s and all the people you found and, and you know, all the events that you put together and, you know, tell that whole story. And, you know, that really resonated with me. And I was like, yeah, you know, that sounds fun. I think that, uh, it, it'd be a very inspirational no story for horror fans you know a journey like this can be taken right and also too uh, I had no idea about uh, Jane Krakowski was almost cast as Judy that blew my mind <laughs> yeah yeah imagine that yeah, yeah. I, I, I think she had done or she was about to do National Lampoon's Vacation at that time yes I think somebody had said to me that it turned out that she didn't do Sleepaway Camp but like immediately thereafter, she did vacation. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I, she—I mean, she she had gone through the process, done the audition, and, you know, she was chosen, and you know, I guess it was it was very last minute that you know she pulled out, and and then Robert had his second favorite audition, Karen Fields, come in and, and do the role. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's all these brunettes in the movie, you know. I think Karen Fields yep. uh, was, was perfect to play Judy. I can't imagine any blondes being in the movie, really, because this is New York, you know. <laughs> I can't... Yeah, that's um, true, too. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine any blondes, especially at that time, being in, in a slasher movie that's very New York-like, you know. And a lot of them were filmed in New York at that time. Um, yeah, I think um, Robert had originally said he wanted a blonde because it was like it was a contrast to the brunette brooding Angela. So yeah. like, that's why he wanted a blonde character. But, but right. yeah, after you watch the movie and you see Karen, you know, nail the role as Judy, it's like you, you can't picture it any other way. Yeah, well, I think she's perfect um, for for Judy because she's like the bizarro Angela in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could look at it like that. That's for real. Yeah, so so going back in time, like, how old were you the first time you saw Sleepaway Camp, and, like, what was your reaction at that time? I, I was around 11, and so, yeah, you can imagine seeing that movie, that ending, when you're 11 years old, it just, like, blew my, blew my mind, and and uh, it just stayed, you know, and a, and a lot of horror movies had that, that, you know, that special kick at the very end, uh, you know, get one last scare or whatever. But this was different than that. Like, it wasn't just a jump scare. It was like a, oh my god, I'm not going to stop thinking about this type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it in the theater when you saw it? No. Um, I starred. It was on HBO one night. I mean, I, I didn't even see it on on video at that point. It, it was just. It was on HBO. Like, it was like two or three in the morning, and so I set the timer mm-hmm. on my VCR and recorded it and watched it the next day. Just. That was it. <laughs> that was the beginning of it all. Yeah. Yeah, I um you know, I was about nine or ten. I saw it on USA up all night and like I was bullied in school and this movie provided a a, a, a big relief outlet for me, just as much as Friday the thirteenth did. And like I had a crush on Angela because I thought that she was awesome in the way that she handled her bu- her bullies. You know, that was my mindset yep, at yep. the time. Yeah. And wow, yeah. And that's a theme. That's actually a theme of all of the, uh, the Sleepaway movies, but especially the first one in Return to Sleepaway Camp, you know, really dealt with the whole bullying thing. Yeah. And also, too... Um, I just the movie was chopped up on USA up all night. It was a long time before I saw the movie uncut because none of the video stores I went to had it for some reason. Ah, uh, so so how did they show the end when it first started? You must have seen it like what did they just show her face? Cut yeah, to the credits. Or? Yeah, it was like a cropped, you know, um, kind of letterboxy kind of a thing. From what I remember, I haven't seen yeah. it since then. But like when I saw the the full. The version I was like, "What? I didn't know that there was going to be a penis there." <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say when you when you finally saw the like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was like thirty years ago. I mean, I hope I get to see that cut again someday because I would like to go back and revisit it. You know, <laughs> yeah, <It's> nostalgia. 
Yeah. My dad went to high school with Pamela Springsteen. Um, he was oh. he he was older. She was in my uncle's class. My dad was like the go-to guy for alcohol and pot in those days. So they they <laughs> they knew each other pretty well. I um, I sent her a DM on Facebook about six years ago or something. And I let her know who I was and stuff, and she was so nice to me. She was like, you know, tell your dad I said hi. He was one of the nicest guys I knew when I lived in San Mateo. I thought that was nice. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I just, I, I wish, though, that she would kind of, you know, show her face, you know, in the in, in the convention world, you know, just for a little bit, even one time, you know? Yeah, you know, more than anybody else, she's the one. The fans are always asking me, you know, is there any way, you know, you can get her, even if it's just to do an interview or whatever, and uh, the fans just really, really want to hear from her, but, you know, I guess she, she wants to live you know, kind of more private life. And I don't know if it's that, you know, she wants to be associated with school camp or not, or, or what exactly the thing is. But, you know, she does, she does professional photography. Yeah. It, so, you know, maybe she just wants to focus on that world. But, you, you know, I would love it just as much as you, and I think uh, uh, about a million other fans if she would come out and, and you know, just talk about it, you know? Yeah. And... I, I was I was curious, you know, when you um, when you launched the the website, it was what nineteen ninety eight. Ninety eight. Yep. Yeah. So so how did that begin? Were you working in in like the um, the uh, the the computer world? Yeah, I had I had just kind of gotten online, like maybe a year or two ahead of that, and um, and I would find like message forums online where people were talking about horror movies. Mm -hmm. and, I ended up finding it was a Friday the Thirteenth message board somewhere, um, and I started chatting back and forth with a, this other guy about Sleepaway Camp, you know, because you know, there are all these slasher movies that people were talking about, but that wasn't one of them. So, me and this other guy started chatting back and forth. It turns out he lived all the way out in Australia, but he was also a huge fan and liked a lot of the same things about it. That I did. Yeah. Uh, and the two of us just like hit it off because you know now there's this gem of a movie that not many people know, know about and we're able to kind of talk about the things we love about it and the two of us decided to uh, to together to make this website and yeah. you know and see if we could like you know start getting all the other fans that are out there and give them a place where everybody can kind of get together and talk about it and see what we can find out because at that point in time don't get anything about it you know, any of the people involved in the movies. All that stuff was yeah. in the dark, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and 1998 was also the year that Texas Chainsaw Massacre's first website was launched uh, by, by Tim Harden, who I've talked to. Nice guy. Nice guy. I think I, t I think I talked to him many, many years ago as well. Yeah, he lives next door to the actual house in the movie, and he gives tours of it all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, and I... I don't know if he, he was the one, but somebody put me in touch with the son of uh, John, uh, the son of uh, Jim Sidow, who was the cook. Oh, and yeah. His, yeah, his son, John, um, uh, got me an autograph from him and sent it to me. And that, and it was back in like the late 90s, and I, I, I think Tim might have had something to do with putting me in touch with uh, John. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool that you got that. You it's know. funny how everything is, like, you know, connected. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I've talked, I've talked to a few people left from the movie. Um, I've talked to like uh, uh, Terry McMinn and uh, Alan Danziger and um, Ed Neal and um, oh, who's that? Uh, John Dugan. I've talked to him as well. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. So in 1999, you write a letter to Anchor Bay Entertainment telling them that they should get Felissa and, and Rob Hiltzig for the DVD. Is that is that how it happened? Yeah. Well, well, I had so I had gone to visit Felissa in New York. Uh huh. At her apartment, I actually called a number that turned out leading me to Robert Hiltzig. Wow. So, yeah. So so that weekend was kind of the impetus. So when I, when I sent my letter to Anchor Bay, I was like, you know, I'm in touch with Robert Hilton and Phyllis Rose. You know, I see you guys are going to be putting out the DVD. Let's do something with them. Like, everybody wants to know, 
you know, what's going on with them. Nobody knows. And, and, um, so, you know, eventually after, you know, I, I put something right away and they were like, okay, you know, you know the executives that have so many contacts, you know, mm-hmm. but it, it was a while. Nobody like got right back after that. And, and finally it was like coming down to like a, like a week or I think before that they were going to start, um, pressing the discs or whatever and and then i got a call from bill lustig and he says i just heard about you know what you did and and, and you know can you get robert hiltzik to do a commentary and I'm like you know i'll i'll, I'll call him and I'm, I'm i'll see if i can get him to do it and he's like you gotta you gotta make this happen you know, you know, you know, you know, I was like, oh my god <laughs> so i called robert talked him into it and then i asked them i was like hey you know felissa only lives like 25 minutes away from where Robert is, you know, can we bring her in on that too? And they're like, well, as long as you get Robert to do it, you know, I'll let you bring her in too. And and yeah, that's how it all came together. Yeah, wow, well, they obviously listened, and, you know, here's uh, where it's it, it's gone from there. Uh, yeah, Acre Bay, when I first found out about Acre Bay Entertainment around 2002, I, I was finding out that, you know, they were releasing all my favorite New World movies on DVD and Media Home Entertainment and all the all the Thor and M.I. slasher movies. I was just like, Yeah, yes. definitely. And then when I go to, that's for sure. Yeah, and then when I find out about Shout Factory, I was like, "Who Shout Factory?" He's like, "They're the Anchor Bay of now." <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah they were. Um, uh, was it? I want to say they Anchor Bay became um, Scream uh, Shout Factory. Yeah, like some of the same people. Um, yeah, when when the company changed hands or whatever, some of the same people were involved and became Shout Factory. Interesting, interesting. So finding Felissa at the time was easy, huh? No, I mean it wasn't because like I I actually I had to hmm. I I found a full, a couple Felissa roses mm-hmm. and I sent letters in the mail out to the, these addresses and time was going by and I wasn't hearing anything. Back. And it, it ended out that when I met Jonathan Tiersten, and I, I had told him about, you know, I was trying to get in touch with her. He was like, you know, her real last name, I don't think is Rose. I think mm-hmm. it's something else. And he told me what he thought it was. Mm-hmm. And he says, that, that might, you know, at least help, you know, get your letters into the, to the right mailbox. So I looked up this other name, and I found a couple addresses, and I, I, I sent out new letters, and it turned out that one of them was her and she ended up calling me and, and that's, uh, that's where that all began. Yeah. And once you found her, you were glad cause she's so sweet and she just loves people. Yeah. I mean, it, it was exciting. It's like, uh, I was like, she was like, this is Jeff. I'm like, yeah, she said, so she's like, this is Felissa. I'm like, is this Angela? Yeah. She, yeah it's me. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, she she grew up to be so gorgeous too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've I've looked at all the interviews on the website. Um, you got uh, Catherine Cammy on there, who I've also um, had on the podcast and stuff. But she told me at the time when I had her in 2018 that uh, you know she was she was relatively new to you know the conventions and the fandom and stuff. What what year did you interview her? I actually interviewed her back in I think it was 2000 it was either 2001 or 2002 Um, it was after the reunion because Mm -hmm. by that time I still hadn't found her and that reunion took place in April of 2001 so I want to say it was it was later in 2001 I know it was definitely by some point in 2002 because I can remember uh, I was at a convention with Robert in 2002, and I was like, hey, you're never going to leave what I found now. And, and I was telling him about how I had, you know, Kathy had called me and how I had talked to her, and, you know, she filled me in on everything she was doing. And and so, yeah, she, I, I want to say it must have been, like, beginning of 2002. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know, maybe she knew a little bit about, about the uh, cult success, but not until, you know, fairly recently is this, you know, she's been you know, overwhelmed with it and everything. That's probably what she was probably getting at when I, when I talked to her. 
Um, yeah, I think she. I know the. I want to say the past. I know the past year because of the fortieth fortieth anniversary. But I, I think even maybe a year or two before that, um, she had been doing some shows with Felissa. Um, okay. So I think you know she kind of got brought into that world with Felissa, and and so. Yeah, that probably was was maybe around 2018 or whatever, and and so she finally really kind of got to see like all these fans like ho- like holy moly, I, I I could never imagine that this had such a huge fan base out there. Yeah. <laughs> now I, I noticed when I was going through those interviews, I noticed uh, you didn't have Susie Glaze on there. I I tried to get her on here last year. She said yes, but then when I mentioned Sleepaway Camp, she completely blocked me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's weird. Somebody else told me that they had, you know, gotten in touch with her and, and she, she like, I guess has bad feelings about it or for some reason doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah. And so I, I haven't even attempted because, you know, just because of what I've heard from other people, if, you know, yeah. you know what's the point if she, if she doesn't want to talk about it, if she doesn't want to talk about it. These these '80s horror movies are full of, of 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 at least you know a couple people, each one that don't want to talk about the movie, and you know they they can't even find you know clo- they don't even want to find closure, and they can't find closure. It's sad, you know. Yeah, it is, and, and you know, and part of it is is that they're just not aware of of how big it is to other people, and like yeah. you know, you know, you go go look at the website and look, and just see all the fandom out there, like. I think a lot of the ones you have heard from, they're, they're the type of people that have no clue that, like, what these conventions, you know, are like or, yeah. or, or what the fans are like. Uh, I think some people will say, you know, like, way back when Aiden Dream King would talk about having a stalker because of Friday the 13th, I yeah. think they still maybe look at it a little bit like that. Well, the, 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 there's um, there's people in the in the major franchises that have had stalkers, and quite frankly, I, I think um, if they weren't making so much money, they they wouldn't be doing these conventions. <laughs> you know, just, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, I think money is what lured a lot of them into it. You know, and that's unfortunate. But the people who truly love being there for the fans, those are the people that I have so much respect for. You know, because they don't have to do it, and yet they do. And I just I love those people. Yeah, oh, totally. And, and I've seen it, you know, going, uh, setting up all the original Sleepaway Camp reunions. And stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you watched it go from, you know, going at, in there and the, and everybody was just excited to to meet their fans and talk to people who liked their movie. Mm-hmm. But then as time went on, you know, and the whole convention thing started, they started doing more of them and more of them. You know, certain people started, like, thinking more about the money end of it. And then suddenly, oh, you know, they got a little bit of a different attitude towards it. I eventually kind of started not wanting so much to do with the convention stuff anymore because I saw what was happening to some other people. So I was just yeah. like, you know, this, this isn't what I want. I'm about you know, the fandom and the excitement and the happiness. You know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not here to learn other people's pockets. <laughs> Yeah, the, the the joy has really been sucked out of the convention scene lately. You know, I I think you know something will will come to a head, you know, in the future. But yeah, it's just I don't I don't enjoy the my, myself going there that much as as much as I did in the beginning. Um, did you try to get an interview with Brian Patrick Clark from Sleepaway Camp Two? No, I uh, I'm actually not sure what he's up to right now. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm actually not sure what he's up to right now, I, if he's still acting or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I talked to him a couple of years ago. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's he's been out of it and, and stuff, but he's always happy to give interviews. He doesn't mind talking about stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I, I should I should maybe reach out to him, because mm-hmm. uh, believe it or not, I'm, I'm actually I'm working on, um, we're doing an expanded edition of the original book, nice. because it came it came out and it like it was such a success and, and, and like the first uh, printing sold out in a week so yeah. they had to do a second printing and do you want to talk some more about the sequels and stuff and I'm like sure because I'm a, I'm really good friends with a couple people from the sequels and you know I was like I'd be happy to bring them in on it and and, uh, mm-hmm. and yeah I mean, I, and I've never talked to to Brian Clark so uh, 
he'd maybe be a good person to talk to. He's a very nice, very approachable guy, and you know he's 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 been there, a part of Hollywood history. He was on a lot of great shows back in the day, like Eight Is Enough and stuff. You know, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He's, but yeah, he's got, um, send me his contact information. I'll see. I mean, he's on LinkedIn. I, I think I may have an email for him, uh, but I'll, I'll check. Oh, oh, oh. I'll check. Yeah, yeah. If you do, you, you do. You know, because like, yeah, I think he might be a nice voice to add to the book a little bit. Yeah, he's a very nice guy. D- do you like the sequels just as much as the original? Yes, I, I do. A lot of people think you know, because like the Sleepaway Camp one guy, they all, he only likes the first one on sequels. Totally not true. I'm a fan of the entire franchise. Yeah, um, I like Pamela's wisecracks in the in the sequels the most, but the first yep. one I'm a purist of. I love the first one the most. Yeah, I mean the first one has a vibe. To it. Yeah. So the best way I describe it, is it has a vibe unlike any other movie I have ever seen, and I love the sequels, but they're not so much like. Ha- they don't have something that's like so different about them. The first one has. Yeah. I and plus it was you know it was it was done for the first time and it came from a place of creativity. You know it it wasn't a cash cow yet. You know. Um, yep. Michael Simpson, I was supposed to interview him a couple of years ago, and then he never got back to me, unfortunately. And the funny thing is, I want to talk more about Fast Food than Sleepaway Camp 2 and 3, because I love that movie, Fast Food, that he directed with uh, Jim Varney. Um, but, yeah, I... I, I oh, well, this was a while ago now, yeah. when I talked to him about Fast Food, but I, I'm a big Jim Varney fan myself, and like I, I asked him so much about him, I was like, you know, he was earnest, you know, like, this yeah. is... And he had, yeah, Michael had a lot of great memories and good stories about working with him. So, yeah, if you ever get a chance to talk to him about it, I remember he had some good info. Awesome. Uh, What's your favorite kill um, in the series? Wow. Um, (laughs) I have have so many. It's like, um, (laughs) I, I, I say that my favorite in the first one, only because mm-hmm. it's so shocking that you know the character that you know of Paul that you like so much, and, you know, to, to see him actually get beheaded is, is it's such like a shock. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's not it's not that it was the most creative of all the the murders, but it was the most impactful, I think. Yeah. Um, but you know, like in the second one. Easily, my favorite is the outhouse toilet drowning. Yeah, that, that was like just the craziest yeah. thing that you'll never. Forget. It, and they did so much of it, basically just sound effects. Yeah, and oh, uh, and, and you know, and then the third one, I love the slack pole thing. It's just you know, that was just another just yeah. such a creative. Um, this the series, and that's one of the things that. I, I love the uh, the chef's boiling hot water because the guy's a fucking pervert exposing himself to his Oh, kids. yeah. Yeah, fucking burn that fucker up, man. And that makeup was just so convincing, too. You know? Oh, exactly. The makeup there and the bubbling blisters on his face. That, and, you know, the first time I got to see that movie, you know, yeah. when we went to Texas in 2001, and yeah. we showed Robert Hiltzik's 35 millimeter. Yeah, and it, it was my first time seeing it on the big screen and when I saw Chef Artie's face up there boiling and you heard the yeah. sound coming from the speakers and music and all that. oh my it was so intense I, I mean it, it was always memorable you actually get to see it on the big screen like that mm. oh man it's something else yeah and of course Catherine looked hot in the shower <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and to, to do you know her effect that they did? They just sculpted it right on the floor, right next to where the shower was. Yeah, uh, the makeup. I just sculpted it right there on the floor. Uh, she was she was feeling ill the night they did it, and he he sculpted it on her back. He put her up in the shower. She did what she had to do, and she fell onto a mattress. And that was it. So, what other horror movies uh, from the eighties do you like? 
I'm actually a huge 80s horror movie buff. I'm like, uh, yeah. you know, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Halloween. Uh, I mean, I, I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think 1981 was the best year for slasher flicks. There was um, Just Before Dawn, Madman, The Burning, The Prowler, Night School, Final Exam, My Bloody Valentine, The Pit, Bloody Birthday. Oh, God, I love all those movies. Yep. Friday 2, Halloween 2. Yes. Um, oh, God. I just I, I just had it on the tip of my brain. And I lost it. There was, a, there was another one. But, yeah, I mean, those are all great. Um, what about horror anthologies? Oh, like Creepshow? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was lucky to, um, when I was doing the book, I talked to uh, Ed Fountain, who mm. did a lot of the effects on uh, Creepshow 1 and 2. He was, like, the mechanical effects guy. Yeah. And I love in Creepshow 2, like, uh, you know, the hitchhiker, all crazy ride and all that abuse and everything that, that he ends up going through. And, you know, I was able to, to hear from um from Ed, like how some of that stuff was done, and that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, um, I love um, Creep Show one and two. I love um, uh, After Midnight. Uh, Cat's Eye is okay. There's a couple of good uh, moments in there. Um, yep, Cat's Eye. Yep. Two Evil Eyes. Um, uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. Yep, that. Uh, the Mummy. I love that one. Do you, do you remember Dead Time Stories? You're gonna. Oh, we, I know the director. <laughs> I know Jeff. Yeah, he's been on. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's crazy because years ago, like I tracked him down, and um, before the movie even came out on like on Blu-ray or DVD or anything, I had the laser disc Image Entertainment put out, like when the movie first came out, mm -hmm. and I put it onto a DVD for him, and I sent it to him, and. He was trying to make a deal to get the movie put out on DVD with this DVD that I sent him because he felt, you know, for DVD, the quality was good enough. Yeah. But eventually when, uh, when uh, Shout ended up putting it out, um, they, they were able to find some of those original elements and put together a pretty nice looking version of it. I, I'm also friends with Catherine DePrume, who was Goldilocks in the movie. Oh, I love her. She she's so awesome. Yeah, she she's got she's got a true New York mouth. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did, did you ever see Jeff did a, a movie? Um, I think I think it's called Random Shooting in L.A. What's it called? Uh, I want to say it's Random Shooting in L.A. Random Shooting. No. It, it, yeah, it's about like the. I, I think it's like about the journey of like a video camera throughout LA one day, mm -hmm. and um, Catherine is in, she has like this role. She's like a call girl, and mm -hmm. she talks in a, a Russian accent. It, uh, it's it's hilarious. If you enjoy her performance in Golden Fox, you should check that out. I I may have heard about it, but I never saw it. But I'll definitely check that out if you recommend it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you talk to Jeff, so you know he's in. He's in I ask him about it. He'll be able to tell you, you know, where you can where you can find it. Okay, awesome. So, are, are you uh, partaking in the uh, the documentary that's been been trying to uh, be finished the last you know few years? No, I, I I never had anything to do with that. I've actually heard like people telling me that um, I guess they they only raised they didn't even raise a quarter of what they needed, and yeah. then they did. I guess they didn't even refund the fans. They just took the money, and they keep saying that they're going to put it out, but it, it never ends up happening. Yeah, I, I, I contributed a little bit to it, which I regret now. Um, I, I've, I've, I've had some issues with indie horror stuff that I've contributed to, unfortunately. That's why I don't endorse them anymore. But, like, yeah, I don't know what the status of that is. Um, I The guy who does the uh, the conventions for uh, Felissa and all of them, he was, like, behind it and stuff. He does all these different... Um, documentaries for all these different horror franchises of who his clients are and stuff. He and I are enemies, unfortunately, so I don't know the, the status of the movie now. So, what's next for uh, Jeff Hayes? Like, do you have anything in, in the works? Uh, you mentioned before the, the other book. Yep. Um, 
so I'll be working on that, and uh, it, so it'll be an expanded edition of the first book, but it'll have a lot more information on it, the sequels, and, and just some more, um, um, you know, different takes from different communities on, on a, you know, the, the vibe of the first movie, uh, you know, which is going a little bit more in-depth with it, and um, I'm going to have, you know, more new exclusive photos that, you know, have never been seen before, some stuff from the sequels. Um, I'm working on that, and then um, I'm working on another Sleepaway Camp music project with, um, also with 1984 Publishing, and so the book and the music, uh, they're both supposed to be coming out this fall, um, and then from there, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I've done a couple of independent movies, you know, all my friends are like, hey, you got to do another one. You got to do another one. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. If I get some really crazy, crazy ideas. Like, I feel like if I do those, it's going to be something like really crazy. Before. You know, because otherwise, what's the point of watching it? Because you want to watch something gory and, or, or, uh, or whatever. You know, you, you just go back and you look at a giant collection of 80s horror movies. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, like I like I said, you know, I don't support the the uh, indie uh, horror film movement anymore and stuff. All I can say is, if you're gonna get involved in something, make sure you trust these people and be careful. You know? Yeah, it, yeah, they it really is like a race. On the stuff I do, I do like these kind of like low budget. Um, I, I get like a bunch of my friends to work on this stuff. We don't, we don't put together these giant budgets. It's like We'll shoot two or three years and just take, the, you know, the time when we have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's like everybody working on it is doing it because they want to. It has nothing to do with money or anything. And, you know, I take pride in, like, my special effects. And, you know, so if I'm going to make something and put it out, it's going to be something that, you know, that, that'll have things in it that horror fans will, will like about it, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on t t today, and um, yeah, I hope this book continues doing great, and um, I look forward to the next one, and whatever projects you got coming up, man. Yeah, no, I th thanks so much, I, I appreciate it, and, and you know, let me know when you are when you put this interview up, uh, you know, so I can let some people know about it. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Have a great night. Yeah, you too, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Jeff Hayes, ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy. Very passionate about Sleepaway Camp, and I'm so glad uh, that we could have that talk today. And uh, go check out the book, sleepawaycampmovies.com, and the book, you know, Making the Movie and Reigniting the Fire, should be available there, or go to Amazon. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes!